Hello, it's Scott Manley here. It's February 15th and it's time for another batch of Deep Space updates where we go over the news. It's all full of stuff, which is the opposite of space. So I guess it's actually poorly named. Anyway, uh, yeah, we're going to start with a rocket launch. Just rewinding to 9th of February, where over in Russia, in Plesetsk, they launched a, a reconnaissance satellite, Cosmos 2575, also known as Rasberg No. 2. And this launched on the Soyuz 2.1V, which, as I like to point out, is not really a Soyuz. At February 10th, uh, we had a Starlink launch out of Vandenberg. Again, this had been delayed multiple times and originally it was supposed to fly at night. Eventually, you know, the launch time got earlier and earlier and it launched in daylight. 14th of February, we saw Falcon 9 launching USSF-124 for the Space Force and Missile Defense Agency, a national security mission carrying six satellites. Two were the HBTSS, Hypersonic and Ballistic Tracking Space Center, and there was also four other tracking layer tranche zero for the Space Development Agency. Um, 14th of February, of course, Valentine's Day, great if you're getting Valentine's, but if you love SpaceX, then you got to see four fully stacked rockets on four different pads. So we had uh, two on the East Coast in in Cape Canaveral, one at Vandenberg, and then we had a full Starship stack in Boca Chica. Obviously, only three of these rockets flew, but before the other two flew, there was a Soyuz 2-1 launching Progress MS-26 to the ISS, logistics, you know, cargo, all the stuff to keep the Russian end of the space station operating. A uh, few hours later, we had Falcon 9 carrying Nova Sea Lander for Intuitive Machines, also known as Odysseus. So this is the second launch under NASA's CLIPS program. And uh, this is, a, well, this is a cool thing. I want to do a separate video about it, but the Nova Sea Lander is a, it uses a cryogenic propulsion system to get it to the moon and land there. Uh, This is running a methane engine, pressure-fed. Its heritage goes back to the Morpheus lander, which was uh, developed for testing landing techniques, and in itself was derived from Project M. This actually traces its heritage back to Armadillo Aerospace. So yeah, John Carmack was involved, and I am reliably informed that the Nova Sea lander does have enough of a processor to run Doom. Uh, But yeah, so far the mission has been successful. We got some great shots. It was boosted out towards... Uh, the moon and we got to see the excess velocity so it's going to be going a direct trajectory expected to uh, attempt landing on February 22nd so real soon now already and they did have one report that there was an issue with a star tracker which they solved by a software update Uh, anyway and in the last few hours we had another uh, Starlink launch out of Vandenberg so that's a block of group 7 Starlinks and that was the three Falcon 9s launching from those four pads So yeah, rewinding to last Friday, we had uh, Axiom 3 coming back, actually, with its uh, crew. They spent a bit longer in space than was anticipated. They spent a total flight time of 21 days, and 18 of those were docked to the International Space Station. The return uh, to Earth, they spent a couple of days in the Dragon, much longer than usual. Uh, Collins Aerospace posted some footage showing them doing testing of their Zero-G spacesuit that will be the next generation spacesuit for the International Space Station and follow-on uh, you know, commercial destinations. They basically spent two days up to fly parabolic trajectories in the Zero-G re- aircraft. They had 20 tasks that they wanted to fulfill and they had to, of course, perform these tasks within the 20 seconds or so of Zero-G that they have. These are things like securing foot rests, or foot restraints, uh, open, you know, moving through airlocks, and manipulating stuff. And uh, yeah, they were able to get through all 20 tests in uh, the first day. And for the second day, they did extra engineering tests. So their suit looks to be operating pretty well. Uh, meanwhile, by the way, Polaris Dawn announced that they, their launch is now slipping from like April to the summer. And it sounds like the work on the spacesuits is really the biggest blocker here. They're essentially taking the SpaceX IVA suits and trying to make them flexible. Everyone is going to be wearing these suits during the Polaris Dawn uh, EVAs, but uh, they're also going to be using the same suits for launch into space. So they have to make these suits mobile. They have to make them operate and you know under uh, vacuum conditions, and they have to make them comfortable enough for the launch into space. 
So Nikon announced that uh, you know the camera manufacturer they announced that they are sh they've shipped a like what 15 Z9 cameras to the International Space Station on the Cygnus. And this is this is a big deal if you're a camera nerd. So Nikon have been flying cameras to the space uh, well in space since like Apollo 15. And back then it was obviously film, you know, mirror SLRs. They transitioned from film to digital back in 2003 with the you know, Columbia disaster. And now the DSLRs are going away and they're being replaced by the mirrorless hardware. Because honestly, most of the camera manufacturers are sort of sun sunsetting their mirrored you know, DSLRs and replacing them with you know, uh, mirrorless versions. So the Z9 is like the flagship version. It's like a 46 megapixel, 8K video capable monster of a camera. And that's going to be the standard for NASA going forward. So one of the more interesting payloads in recent years has been a, a spacecraft called Barry carrying an IVO quantum drive. What the heck is that? Well, uh, it is a private company that has designed a, an inertialess uh, thruster based on Mike McCulloch's um, quantized inertia theory. And this was placed on a transporter mission launched by SpaceX and it spent the last few months in orbit hoping to be able to test this, th this system which should be able to generate thrust without fuel. And while I am skeptical, um, I'm going to have to remain skeptical because uh, the spacecraft has failed before they could actually test it. The, the spacecraft that carried it was called Barry One. It was built by Rogue Space Systems. And it remained in orbit for a few months, then apparently has had a power failure. And that means they cannot test their revolutionary quantum drive. And I know if you're a conspiracy minded person out there, then you probably think, well, that's awfully convenient for the laws of physics, that this should fail just before they can prove the laws of physics wrong. Uh, on the other hand, you might think, well, that's awfully convenient for, you know, IVO looking for investors in their drive. Uh, but honestly, yeah, I, I don't know what to make of this. You know, quantized inertia is one of these theories that you know, it's not it's not like the random cranks that you find on the internet who are clearly completely wrong within 30 seconds of looking at them. Uh, the idea is that uh, something in the laws of physics says that you have an absolute minimum acceleration that something can experience. And if, it, if an acceleration is below this threshold, then the mass of the object drops until the acceleration hits this. And the threshold is something like 2 times 10 to the minus 10 meters per second per second. So this is supposed to explain things like dark matter and the pioneer anomaly and things like this. I, I, I don't know. <laughs> I certainly can't say that it's right or wrong. And this would have been an interesting thing to test it. But yeah, doesn't apparently work. Another satellite that a lot of uh, people have been interested in for the last few months has been uh, the Space Force's X-37B, the little space plane that uh, was launched on a Falcon Heavy and then uh, promptly disappeared into some highly eccentric orbit and wasn't seen. Well, it turns out the amateurs looking across the night sky have finally found it. It's in a 39 degree uh, orbit with, a, an, in well, with an apogee of 39,000 kilometers, which drops down to a few hundred kilometers. We still don't know what it's doing. Uh, one can guess that this highly eccentric orbit that places a satellite up there lets it, you know, test sensors designed for geostationary orbit, but that is entirely speculation. And the images we have only show a streak moving across the sky. If you want some cool images, then you should look at the footage from the WB-57 that uh, it got during SpaceX's IFT-2 test of Starship. And this footage has finally been released via a FOIA request. However, while we get many cool angles showing the launch on the takeoff, showing um, you know tiles getting torn off, it cuts out right before the staging. The one moment we actually were interested to see NASA explained that it redacted the footage at the request of SpaceX, who claimed that it could reveal trade secrets. So yeah, what we do see is we see some you know, very cool footage on the way up, but nothing, um, yeah, nothing about the staging. But since we're on the subject, I've got to give a shout out to Ryan Hansen, who has been working on a photorealistic physical simulation of the fuel slosh in the booster at the staging. So he has these cool animations showing the fuel 
popping up and sloshing around and you're uncovering those ports, potentially causing too much uh, stress on the hardware. We don't really know what went wrong. We just know that uh, it was pretty wild stuff going on there. And of course, as I mentioned, down in Boca Chica, Booster 10, Starship 28 have been stacked. They are being tested. We're expecting that that may launch now in March because the last we heard, SpaceX had not concluded their investigation, or at least they, if they had, they hadn't submitted the information requested to the FAA. So they're unlikely to get a launch license until they close out their investigation to the FAA's uh, satisfaction. Uh, in in uh, Florida, Blue Origin have set their Pathfinder New Glen, you know, boilerplate vertical on a pad, which is kind of cool to see it actually standing up tall. It's actually one of the longest first stage boosters. And honestly, we've only ever seen it horizontally up till now rolling around. And, uh, you know, that's one place where it could actually beat out Starship because we've never seen Starship on its side. So at least New Glenn could claim to be the longest even if it wasn't the tallest booster. Um, well, obviously, SLS bit beats that out. Yeah, it's looking like it's going to be a fairly big rocket. It looks like they are moving ahead with their plan to launch two of the smallest satellites on the biggest rocket later this year. Uh, we got new images from Ingenuity. Again, the data is sort of trickling down, and we do, do see that one of the blades has apparently torn off completely it wasn't just missing the tips like the other three. This is largely gone completely. That's most likely the one that's been seen sitting 15 meters, 50 feet away. Varda, Varda Aerospace, you remember they had launched a little chemical, you know, pharmaceutical factory into orbit with the plan that it was going to manufacture, you know, high quality pharmaceutical crystals for, you know, science and medication and whatever, and then return them to the earth. And then they were unable to return them to Earth. Well, after about six months, they finally got permission to bring it back. It's going to come back on February 21st to uh, Utah, out to the you know the Dugway Proving Grounds in uh, Utah. So this is like a, a 90 kilogram entry um, capsule. It's about three feet across. It's designed and built by uh, Rocket Lab. So this will be the first Rocket Lab thing to return from orbit with the intention of surviving. So that's pretty cool. Uh, Valentine's Day, by the way, uh, we, well, we obviously had all the usual declarations of love, but uh, most interestingly, we had Bay or BAE loves ball. So BAE Systems wins approval to finally uh, acquire Ball Aerospace for $5.5 billion. And so it sounds like Ball Aerospace will become BAE Space Systems, and that will probably mean that we lose the Ball logo and all this stuff, which means I can no longer point to my can of beer and say, look, Ball logo, Ball Spaceship. But yeah, uh, I'm sure they'll continue to do great work in the space stuff. I just won't be able to compare them to their canning business. There's a lot of talk in the last 24 hours of some Russian secret space nuclear weapon arsenal thing. Uh, and of course, these stories are going all over the place. It, it, I, and I'm going to say, you know, US intelligence frequently overstates the capabilities of foreign assets. Uh, I'm not sure what's going on here, but yes, um, Sure, it would be pretty easy to build an anti-satellite weapon using a nuclear warhead. After all, the US accidentally did this with Starfish Prime. These days, that a lot of satellites, especially military ones, are much more hardened against such things. But all the same, uh, you, you really don't want to be getting into space warfare with nuclear weapons involved because it will have bad effects on Earth. I hope that this is all you know, alarmism and that the real thing is a little more sane or less likely to go rather than say, you know, Russia dropping into fourth place in the best, you know, most capable space nations and deciding to take their ball and go home. And finally, I need to send my congratulations to my acquaintance, uh, Rusty Schweikart, who has been awarded the legendary Explorer Medal by the Explorers Club. You know, the Explorers Club 
goes back giving these awards like a hundred years. You know, you get people like Edmund Hillary and Roald Amundsen and of course Neil Armstrong. But you know, the Legendary Explorer Award is something that's only come in the last 20 years. And it's been like Scott Carpenter, John Glenn, Jane Goodall and now Rusty Schweiker. So yeah, Rusty was on one space mission, but he also worked with Jacques Cousteau out in the Caribbean. He has uh, worked to with B612 Foundation and the Asteroid Institute. And uh, he's also, like, he was one of the founders of the Association of Space Explorers, which is, I guess, like the Explorers Club, but you have to be an astronaut as well. So that's all from this week. Uh, in the next week, things to look forward to is we get launches from Japan, India, and uh, New Zealand. And, of course, we're hoping that we're going to get continual good news updates from Odysseus on its way to the moon. It should land next Thursday. So I'm probably going to have an update before then. But uh, until then, I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.